Good morning, men. It's great to be a man. Come on, that can't be that funny. There are five events that I remember very clearly where I was. And those of you who are old enough would also remember, too, where you were when Kennedy was shot. I remember very clearly where I was when the first space shuttle uh, blew up. I remember where I was on 9-11. I remember where I was when the recent, most recent space shuttle blew up. And I remember where I was the first time I saw the Britney Spears Pepsi commercial. I remember seeing on TV, I I don't know if it was part of the same ad or not, but I do remember Bob Dole, his dog barking, and Bob Dole saying, down boy, down boy. (laughs) Well, this morning our topic in our series, How to Win the Battle for Your Soul, is entitled, Help Men Confront Their Own Sexual Immorality. You remember in an earlier session we talked about showing men how to help other men confront their sexual immorality. This morning, though, we want to turn our attention inward on ourselves. And this is what we want to talk about this morning. What is sexual immorality and what is it not? Why is it such a big deal? And then I want us to talk a little bit about establishing boundaries. And the fine print up here, which you should not be able to read, By the way, if you can read that, let me know. Uh, (laughs) That'd be very interesting to know somebody like that. Uh, Establishing boundaries in a world that doesn't like them. In a world that doesn't like them. And so what we're going to talk about this morning is why why we need to guard against sexual immorality and how do we go about that. And I want to give you a promise as we begin this morning. And the promise is you can have victory, you can have victory over sexual temptation and sin. You can have victory over these things. We're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 this morning, verses 12 to the uh, end of the chapter. And we're going to begin, I want to just read uh, with you together, verse 13, the... uh, middle of that verse, if you can find the middle of verse 13, as we talk about what is and sexual immorality and what is it not. It says this, it says, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. That's what it says. And so, sex as God intended it is between a married man and woman for procreation and physical intimacy. It's a married man and a married woman. It's funny, you used to to feel comfortable just saying it's between two married people, but anyway, today you kind of need to mention that it's a man and a woman. Sex is intended to be between uh, a married man and a married woman, married to each other, Isn't it interesting, all the little nuances that in our culture you have to make sure you're very explicit about? For procreation, by the way, it works very good for its intended purpose there, does it not? I mean, six over six billion people in the world. And then for physical intimacy, pleasure between uh, these, these married couples. And what is then sexual immorality? Well, it's everything else. Sexual immorality is everything else. Everything that does not constitute sexual relations between a man and a woman who are married to each other for procreation or physical intimacy is sexual immorality. So that would include this word sexual immorality here, which is the word fornication in the King James Version. You you just don't talk like that much anymore, but (laughs) uh, it's fornication which would be 
sex when somebody in the relationship is not married. Uh, adultery, which is when somebody in the relationship is married. It would include lust. It would include incest. It would include homosexuality. Those would be some things that are included in sexual immorality. And so we see right away that sexual immorality is all illicit sexual intercourse, real or imagined. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, that you have heard, he said, you have heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, even if you look on a woman with lust in your heart, you have already committed adultery. So it's any illicit sexual intercourse, real or imagined, that's what, what it is. Examples. What are some examples? Some real examples that we see of sexual immorality. Well, there's pornography. I read reams and reams of statistics on sexual immorality this, this week, and I said, you know, I'm not going to pummel you with statistics, but you, you do know that the Internet is a, a rampant and out-of-control source of illicit sexual images. And then another example, in addition to pornography, would be what are some of the what are some of the things that, 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 that happen as a result of illicit sex? Where does it come from and what are some of the things that happen? What are some of the things that are going on out there? Okay, so voyeurism. That's enjoying somebody else's sex, which is I guess a form of pornography, right? How about uh, sexual fantasizing? Would that be sexual immorality? Well, using the definition that Jesus gives, and we've just outlined here, yes, that, that would be. How about uh, at, at the office, at your work, inappropriate uh, physical contact with someone of the opposite sex? Absolutely, absolutely. I just would encourage you, especially you younger men, I'm 56 years old, and I can stand here today, and of course now Satan's going to come after me as soon as I say this, <laughs> but I can, I can say, say to you, with look you straight in the eye, and tell you that I'm 56 years old, and I have never, ever had, in a, I've never, ever acted inappropriately toward another woman, in, 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 ever. And it's not because I'm good, but it's because I understand what we're about to read in the scriptures. And it's because I fear God in, in the right way. Because I fear God. And it's because in my own personal experience, I have had nine friends. You know, you think, you, you, you know, you talk and you think, well, I've known hundreds of people or dozens of people or scores of people that have been vol involved in sexual immorality and whose lives have come unglued. But that's probably not true. <laughs> it's... So I said, I'm going to sit down, I'm going, to, I'm going to actually make a list of the people with whom I have personal relationships or friendships that have had their lives destroyed or almost destroyed because of sexual immorality. And, and I have nine. I have nine people in my life. And in four of these situations, I was personally involved in walking through the process of redemption and restoration with these people. So I've been involved personally in four incidents of sexual immorality, walking through, trying to help. Two of them were successful, and two of them turned out poorly. And it's interesting because one of them that turned out poorly was the very first one that I was involved in. I had just become a Christian. I was 24 years old. I was in a small group. There were six of us in the small group. And one of the guys walked in one day and announced that he was leaving his wife, two young children, and going to marry his secretary. And uh, it was interesting because I just couldn't, 
I just couldn't accept it. I couldn't accept it. So I asked him if he would be willing to meet with me once a week. And the, other, the, the group disbanded, basically, at that point. Uh, and, uh, but I asked him, I said, would you be willing to meet with me once a week and let's talk about it? And he was just hard-hearted. There was just absolutely no, no change in his mind. And do you know, today, it's now 24, I'm 56, so it'd be over 30 years ago, that uh, he has still destroyed his life and the, wife of, uh, the, the life of his ex-wife. And, and his, children, his, his children. If he could have looked at his little, two little babies, and they were like you know, one and three at the time, if he could have looked at them and, 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 and imagined two separate futures for those children, I wonder if he would have done it. I wonder if he did not. He probably wouldn't have believed that it would turn out as badly as it has, but <laughs> I wonder if he would have done it. I wonder if he done it. Because the, the consequences of this are not just for now. This is why it's such a big deal to God. The consequences of sexual immorality are not just for now. They're for a long, long, long time. Long time. Make it ten. I just saw another guy in here that I know has been through this. Okay. So what is sexual immorality and what is it not? That's a pretty good idea. Let's maybe try to differentiate finally between temptation and sin. Uh, Sexual temptation is not sin, right? Uh, What is the difference between sexual temptation and sexual sin? Well, sexual temptation is when you're driving down Park Avenue in Winter Park and you see and you are aroused by a beautiful woman. Sexual sin is when you drive around the block to make sure that you were seen correctly. (laughs) I knew this this couple one time and and they were just very outgoing. He was they were very outgoing. She was particularly outgoing and and a true extrovert and true lover of people. Very, very Christian. I mean, love Christ. And uh, she came up to me one day, you know, not long after I met her, to hug me. To hug me. And she, I know that she was completely unaware of what she was doing, all right? But it resulted in, trust me, a monumental sexual temptation. Because she came up and she hugged me, and she pressed her pelvis against my thigh. I mean, wow. What was that all about? But you know, it's, it's interesting. It take, how long does it take? How long does it take to become, for a man to become sexually aroused? How long does it take for a hummingbird to flap his wings? It's just instant. And there's nothing you can do about it. There's nothing you can do about it except, except two options. Feel completely guilty for that which you had no control over. Or turn your attention to the Lord Jesus Christ, thank Him that He has created us the way He has, thank God for the beauty of this this woman, and ask Him to protect you from sexual sin, from fantasizing, from from using your imagination to to lust. That's about it. That's That's about what you can do. Did anybody else know that uh, woman I was talking about? (laughs) No. All right. Now, why is sexual immorality such a big deal? Now, you're probably expecting me to, to give you the human toll. To talk about broken families to talk about the fact that a child is five times as likely to grow up in poverty when they come from a broken home. Or the fact that you can get sexually transmitted diseases and that 56 million Americans have an incurable sexually transmitted disease. What's that, about one in five? Or you might be thinking that, might be expecting me to say something like, Kids get pregnant, teenage pregnancy, or the problems with infertility as a result of these STDs and cancer, or 
the difficulty in repairing a broken trust between a husband and a wife or the retaliation that takes place when a spouse has been offended and, and he or she is angry at her spouse for so she retaliates. You might be expecting that that why, might be why this is such a big deal. And I'm sure that's part of it. But the real reason that this is such a big deal is contained here in God's holy writ. And let's take a look at it together. Let's start at verse 12. It's interesting, the verses 12 and the first half of 13 actually deal with uh, food. Food, but we'll read them. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. And then into this text on sexual immorality. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Your body is meant for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. Your body is meant for the Lord, and the Lord is, is for your body. In the New Living Translation, it says this, speaking of our bodies, they were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our bodies. Here's the big idea today. The big idea today is that our bodies are the property of Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. Our bodies belong to Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. Let's see how he does that and why. And why this is such a big deal. Verse 14. By his power... God raised the Lord from the dead. That's the resurrection. It's an amazing concept. And he will raise us also. He's going to raise us from the dead to immortality, and we are going to be given new bodies. Jesus is all about protecting his property. Verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? So, <laughs> our bodies belong to Jesus. They're made members of Christ when we are grafted into him through faith. Reading on, shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body. And the big idea this morning, our bodies belong to Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. He doesn't want his property united with a prostitute or a sexually immoral woman. For it is said, the two will become one flesh. What's interesting about sex, sexual intercourse, is that our bodies belong to Jesus, and Jesus is all about protecting his property. And what he does is that he, he has instituted marriage, and he said, okay, your body belongs to me, but I'm going to loan it to her. Your body belongs to me, but I'm going to loan it to him. And in order to procreate, and to give you, to bless you with a pleasure in this fallen world, I'm going to allow you for a season to belong to each other. I'm going to delegate my property. I'm going to assign my property. I'm going to lease my property to you two together. Verse 17, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him, 
in spirit. This is the mysterious mystical fusion that we have with Jesus, and marriage is the mysterious mystical fusion that we have with our spouses if we're married. And for that reason, he says then, in verse 18, he says, "Ah, flee from sexual immorality. Don't get caught up in that. I don't know how Paul, what, what he was, his attitude was, we don't know, but we just, we just know that he didn't say, he said, flee! He said, flee! From sexual immorality. The difference between men and women when it comes to fleeing from sexual immorality? Women flee from sexual temptation. Men slowly crawl away, hoping temptation will overtake them. The big idea here, our bodies are the property of Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. Flee, therefore, from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Our bodies belong to Jesus, and Jesus is all about protecting his property. It's a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. Here it is. Here it is. Watch this. Watch this. You are not your own. You are not your own. Your body, my body, our bodies belong to Jesus. We are not our own. Our bodies belong to Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. And so STD, it's a warning. It's it's a warning. And it's a consequence. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Our bodies are the property of Jesus. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. So these boundaries are not a curse. They are a blessing. You are not your own. You are bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with his property. Honor God with your body. So yeah, the the human toll is devastating. Yes. But the reason that we avoid sexual immorality is not because, primarily because of the human toll, but it's because our bodies belong to Jesus. And Jesus has something better for our bodies than sexual immorality. He has gifts for us that far exceed whatever pleasures might come from sexual immorality. His commands are are gracious. Therefore, our protection, our blessing, our joy. And there are wicked people out there who have been incited by some force. Christians know this force to be Satan the devil. But everybody knows there are wicked forces out there that would bring people, even non-believers know there are wicked forces out there that would bring people down through the consequences of sexual immorality. All his ways are pleasant ways, and all his paths are peace. So it is, it is for our benefit that God has set up rules, commands, laws. All oh, these are words we don't like in our generation. We're the generation of the individual. 
We're the generation uh, that we want to write our own plan. We are the generation that resists authority. We are the generation that is an authority unto ourselves. We are the generation of Saul, King Saul. At a time when they wanted a king, it says in the scriptures, it was a time that everybody did what seemed right in their own eyes. Everybody did what seemed right in their own eyes. And the result was century after century after century of unnecessary pain and suffering. And that's the message this morning, is that do not be in rebellion against a holy, gracious, loving, joy-giving God. Christianity is a peaceable religion. When you act Christianly. So these rules on sexual morality, they're for our benefit. But they're because our bodies belong to Jesus. There is property. Yes, they're for our benefit, but the higher calling here is that our bodies belong to Jesus. That's what the text says. And Jesus is all about protecting his property. And so he sets up boundaries for our benefit. Now let's take a look, finally, at uh, establishing some boundaries. Let's talk a little bit about your kids. This is kind of like the practical piece of this, okay? For your kids, for your children, do you think that your children are at risk for sexual temptation and sin? I mean, that's kind of the... Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be a question that would just almost make you yawn? How could, the, how could the speaker even be so stupid to ask that question? Well, now let me ask you a question. Do your children understand God's plan for sex? Do your children... Have your children come to understand God's plan for sex from you? Do they understand that their bodies belong to Jesus? That, they're, that our bodies are the property of Jesus and what a beautiful thing sex in the proper context is? Well, if you have waited, it's never too late. One guy went to his son and said... Uh, Son, uh, you have a few minutes we could talk about sex? He said, sure, Dad. What do you want to know? <laughs> Kids know it all. The, uh, the numbers on the number of sexual um, situations on television that they are exposed to, um, it's in the multiple thousands each year. So they already know a lot about sex, but they're getting their cues from movies and from peers who don't know anything more about it than they do. And I read an article uh, this week about some children who have been in a sex education class. And trust me, I mean, they're, they're dumber than doorknobs even after going through the class. So make sure that your kids uh, do get exposed to God's plan. Now, uh, I'm going to recommend my own book, The Young Man in the Mirror, if you've got sons 13 years of age and older. You know, what about masturbation? What about oral sex? How far is too far? All these kinds of questions. Direct answers uh, in, in here. And then uh, how about you? And how about me? 
Well, the Bible says flee sexual immorality and to honor God with your body. So that's what we're supposed to do. But how do you do that? How do you do that? Well, I think step one is just to be honest with ourselves and ask the question, you know, how, how is it that I am tempted? I read about uh, a, uh, an, uh, an advertisement, a Speedo bathing suit advertisement that Michael Phelps is in, apparently with uh, a girl in a bikini who's pulling her bikini down. That's what, that's what I read about it. So this morning, I went out onto the Internet to see if I could find this ad so I could make my own judgment about whether or not to mention it. <laughs> and two things happened. Number one is I was nervous as a cat that I was going to land on some porno site and then start getting bombarded with pornography. So I kept, every time I saw a place where it might be, I kind of went to the, instead of going to that site on Google, I went to the homepage to see if it was a legitimate site. I went to one pop culture online or something <laughs> to see if that was going to be a legitimate site. And I saw two guys together in a swimming pool uh, with their arms around each other. And, and I punched, trying to punch the close button on that one as fast as I could. I don't know if anything would come of that or not. But anyway, <clears throat> I never did find the, the ad. But, but we, we, were in a sec, we live in a sex-saturated society. Do you think advertisers care about you? Do you think advertisers care about you? Do you think they care about your kids? Do you think, do you think advertisers care if your kids have sex? Do you think they care if your kids get pregnant? Do you think they care if your kids have an abortion? Do you think they care if your kids get addicted to pornography or you? Do you think they care if your kids have a child out of wedlock? Do you think they care if your kids use drugs? quit high school, go to college, get a good paying job, get divorced, end up being successful, or you. And what they care about is whether or not your kids have money and whether or not you're will they're, they're willing to buy their products. And apparently some of them are willing to do anything to make that happen. Our language is the language of love, nurture, encouragement, helping our kids find something significant they can do, finding meaning and purpose for their lives, finding something they can do well, finding a life mate, making wise choices, getting a good education, having a family of their own. But the language of advertisers is money. So, be honest with yourself. How are you tempted? How are your kids tempted? And then set up some boundaries. If, if you have a problem with movies, if movies, you go to a movie, and you find that it stimulates sexual fantasizing, then don't go to those kind of movies. Or if in the privacy of your home, you find that you're tempted by certain types of uh, television... And then, then either don't watch television by yourself or block the channels or whatever. If it's the internet, if it's a certain part of town, if it's a certain person. Hey, if you are employed and you are, you are, you have, you're struggling with a woman in your office. Quit. Find yourself another job. Why throw it all away? Why throw it all away? And then the verses, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, which we'll be getting to. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. But God's faithful, so we can go to God and ask God to protect us from sexual sin when we are tempted. And it says he is faithful and will, and, and will 
help us to overcome the temptation. And when you have sinned, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just. He will forgive our sins. He will cleanse us of all righteousness. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus. And so we can get back. No matter what you've done, no matter how you're being, you've been tempted, God will provide a way of escape. If you'll turn to Him, He's peaceable. And if you have sinned sexually, as statistics tell us that uh, 50% of the men, Christian men, actively seek out pornography, if you're involved in sexual sin, God will forgive that, but then you need to establish some boundaries around what you allow yourself to do, to see, to be. Well, I wish I could end on a funny story. But it's not very funny, is it? <laughs> now when you see some of the devastation that's been wrought in the lives of men because of sexual immorality. So let's pray. First of all, our dear Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you that our bodies are your property and that you are all about protecting your property. So thank you for the rules and the laws and the regulations and Father, we, we ask you to grip our rebellious hearts and bring us to repentance. And Lord, for uh, men who, uh, who need forgiveness, Lord, I, I, just, if you want to talk to the Lord about this, just take a moment and uh, tell him what's on your heart. Ask him for forgiveness. Uh, if you have an addiction, then uh, prayer will not be enough. You'll also need professional counseling to go along with that. And so uh, just, uh, just tell the Lord that you would like to pursue that if, if you need to. And uh, just take a moment and do that if you would. Lord, I uh, pray that you would not only hear but answer these prayers because they are made in accordance with your will. In Jesus' name, amen.